Yes, uh, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the latest in our series of Year of Trade webinars exploring some of the key themes for business of the uh, EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Um, so far we've had a really fabulous turnout and some really interesting discussions and I know that we'll continue that theme today. We have an absolutely stellar panel. Uh, we have Tom uh, from the Cabinet Office, we have Liam uh, of BCC and we have Dan from the British uh, Chambers um, in Belgium and the EU, each of whom is uh, an absolute expert on one or more areas around border and customs, which is what we're here to discuss today. Um, I'm going to ask each of the panellists just to introduce themselves and say a couple of words briefly in a second. Um, but before I do, um, I just want to say a, a couple of quick rules. Um, please do put your questions into the question and answer box. Based on the last couple of these, I don't think we'll be able to cover all of them, but we'll cover as many as we can. Um, and I should also say that we, a lot of these are specific and that's that's very handy, very interesting, very useful for us all. Um, but we may have to make them a little bit more general as we ask them just to uh, keep them very interesting and uh, occasionally to avoid uh, libel and slander. Um, this um, session will be recorded um, and we will put it up on YouTube shortly afterwards. Um, I have no idea how it's done, but some very efficient technical people normally do it within 24 hours. Um, so don't feel like you have to take notes, it will all come back again. But do please um, remember when you're watching that, that, uh, you know, things may change. This is quite a fast moving area. So, you know, do check against everything. Um, when you are thinking about your own business and your own position, you know, nothing we're going to say today, I'm afraid, can take the position of proper, focused, detailed, specific advice. We do our best to be accurate. And given the quality of the panel, I'm certain we are accurate. But a lot of this is very fact specific and will depend exactly on the circumstances <clears throat> that your business find themselves in. That's the nature of the question. Um, look, beyond that, we're going to have a fabulous discussion. This is one of those things that only really the British Chambers and the Global Business Network can provide through the 53 accredited chambers within the UK and the more than 70 overseas chambers. We can get a really wonderful breadth of insight, expertise, um, and analysis uh, and bring it to you um, and I think that that is reflected very much <clears throat> in the quality of the panel alas not quite so much the chair uh, so in no particular order, I'm going to come first please to Dan Dalton who is the chief executive uh, officer CEO of the British Chambers in Belgium and the EU and one of the most seasoned EU trade watchers there is so Dan uh, over to you if I could ask you just to introduce yourself and say a few words please Thank you, James. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, well, I think you, you more or less introduced me there, James. Um, the only thing I would say is I was an MEP uh, prior to uh, uh, the UK leaving. So uh, I have followed all of this uh, from from the inside, if you like. Um, maybe just to set a little, little bit of the scene of where we are at the moment um, uh, from the EU to UK side first. Now, from that side, because the UK hasn't brought in its full customs regime yet, it's relatively smooth, um, more or less at the moment. We haven't seen huge um, uh, concerns or complaints yet from the EU side coming into uh, the UK, not in terms of commercial shipments anyway. Um, uh, the real problems we are seeing are coming the other way though, from the UK uh, into the EU. And just to give you a, some, some figures, um, so this is from um, the Flanders Investment uh, Trade and Investment Body uh, the, that we deal very closely with in Belgium. They say that 10% uh, of the forms on Belgium uh, exports to the UK are currently wrong or incorrect um, and are therefore um, causing problems with uh, delivery. Um, however, 80% of forms filled in by UK exporters to Belgium are wrong and are therefore being uh, rejected or uh, held up until they are right. Um, uh, from the Dutch next door, we, we had... Um, uh, from them, some figures that one only one in every hundred trucks that was arriving uh, in the Netherlands was actually had the correct paperwork and was being allowed in. Now this is going back two or three weeks. Situation is getting a little bit smoother, but but still, there are severe um, problems. And the main problems I think are um, just that the forms are not being filled in correctly, um, particularly on the um, export health certificates. The 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 forms that are filled in by vets. Uh, that's the area where we're seeing significant problems. Uh, also, just because of the nature of the trade deal, um, 
nearly a third of all products that are, uh, are coming in of uh, uh, with SPS issues or from animal origin are, are normally expected to be checked under the deal. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is the UK wanted a, a more distant relationship uh, um, on that. But that means that on SPS and on um, uh, products of animal origin, there are severe um, uh, difficulties in getting most of that in. If you have a look at any of the British supermarkets in Europe, they are all empty at the moment. Um, they, um, in fact, we've got one here in Belgium that haven't been able to get a delivery in at all since the start of the year and are unlikely to. Um, so, I mean, that's just a, a basic background. The other big area we're seeing lots of problems are um, in e-commerce and um, business to consumer deliveries across borders um, with uh, consumers on both sides facing um, significant uh, charges uh, when they are uh, picking stuff up. Um, and just one last point before I hand back to James, uh, an area where there's some increasing concern but at the moment it's masked a little bit by the, the, the COVID situation is uh, in terms of services and what uh, services a, a UK based uh, individual could provide in different European countries uh, under the 90 day uh, uh, visa waiver scheme effectively that we have the 90 day um, uh, uh, tourist visa effectively. Now this is, we, we can go into more detail in this because it, it, it varies from country to country and the rules are not the same across all countries, but just uh, to say on this that even the Belgium government that we have to talked to quite closely on this are not fully aware at this stage, uh, can't give us clear advice on what um, business trips would be allowed in Belgium uh, under the uh, TCA. So uh, lots of things to talk about, happy to talk about them in more detail, um, but that's just a brief introduction of where we are. Thank you, Dan, that, that's incredibly helpful and, and a really good way to set the scene. Thank you so much. And um, I haven't heard the figures quite as high as 80%, but that does ring true with some of the, the stories we're hearing. Um, so very welcome and great to have you. Uh, moving on now to our second panellist, we have uh, Tom Smith, who is a director at the Cabinet Office with responsibility for border and protocol delivery. So Tom, pretty easy few months for you, quite light workload. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, you've had lots of sleep and lots of relaxing weekends. But uh, over to you just to say a little bit more about yourself and, and your view of the current position, please. Thank you, James, and um, good afternoon to everyone. Yes, yeah, so, um, so I'm in the Border and Protocol Delivery Group, which is part of the Cabinet Office. We report to Michael Gove. We exist basically because the border is a complex mechanism. Different departments own different bits. So, you know, we aren't HMRC, we aren't DEFRA, we aren't Border Force. But we exist because somebody needs to pull it all together. And that means we tend to be the people who get asked about how the border is doing, why, and what can be done about it. So I'm just gonna say a bit about those things now. Well, how is the border doing now? Well, you know, glass half full, glass half empty is trite, but let's just say that the glass is actually more full than we feared it would be um, a few months ago when we were thinking of what, what's it gonna be like at the beginning of February. Back in September, um, we published the reasonable worst case scenario in Parliament. And this was the one that you would have seen picked up on because it was the one that talked about warnings of 7,000 HGVs queuing in Kent. Basically, the concern was that not only would many traders not be ready and be trying to trade when not ready, but the ones who were ready would be stuck behind the ones who weren't. And the relief in terms of James asking how I've been sleeping is that this so far has not happened. Uh, two reasons, partly because there were various things that could have gone wrong with our own preparations, but our IT systems are working in terms of their core functionality. And I'll say a bit more about that in a minute and what it means. The extra staffing that we geared up was in place, our infrastructure was in place, and our traffic management and contingency planning have stood up, including with the nice little surprise that the French gave us on the 20th of December, when they suddenly announced that all outgoing travellers, including freight drivers, needed to have negative COVID tests before they could pass the border. So that, that's been okay. The, um, our figures are suggesting that only around 5% of HGVs are getting turned back at British ports. This is for a mixture 
of not having a COVID test and for border unreadiness. And that, that's much lower a percentage than we feared. And um, the other thing that we are not yet seeing is particular ports on the continent being completely snarled up because their checking facilities are being overwhelmed. And um, so before I talk about what the issues we are having, then I think it's worth just remembering that that was what we feared and that it's not come to pass. But am I saying all is fine? No. Obviously, we are hearing um, what I'm sure I'm going to hear more of today, that some businesses are encountering difficulties trying to trade and that others are holding back from trading to avoid running into those difficulties. What people are encountering, encountering I think, it's a kind of combination of learning curve and the and what things are just going to be like. It is more complex to trade with the EU now, and it and it will remain more complex than it was before. So the the deal that was done, which was a massive relief um, on Christmas Eve, gives us a framework for co collaboration with the EU, and of course, it's got the very significant thing of no tariffs. We will try to use that framework to boost mutual understanding and smooth frictions. But I think one thing we have to be clear on, the, the ministers that I work for are not going to start negotiating anything with the EU that has the effect of a customs union or a set of common rules with the EU on agri-food. And, and ministers do know that some businesses disagree with this position and in some cases quite strongly. but that is quite fundamental to what this government got elected on, and I would not bet on it changing. Some of the friction is about the is also about the newness of the systems that people are trying to work. So this is not us blaming business. It's just it is just a learning curve for for everyone, for business, for intermediaries, for the UK government, and also for our counterparts in the European Union who are having to get used to. It's new ways of working and um, for, for, for things to flow systems have to work end to end so the um, the actual you know availability of systems like chief and the and the transit system have been good we know also that you know whether chief works and whether whether ncts works kind of is dependent on your system or from your software um the portals and then how also how it works in the EU. So some of the friction is coming from that. Incidentally, I mean, all of the same applies to trade from GB to Northern Ireland under the Northern Ireland protocol. Overall, the goods are flowing and overall some businesses are facing difficulties in making this work. And this is quite understandably getting a lot of attention because of the particular status of Northern Ireland and the political focus on the Northern Ireland Protocol. So what are, we, what are we trying to do about it? We've put out a lot of material in terms of um, what we think people need to do and being as helpful as we can. We are hearing this comment of, you're telling us what to do, but not how to do it. I don't think that's completely fair. We are, we are trying to do what we can in terms of the, the how to do it. What we are also hearing is, um, you're not you're not telling me you're not advising me exactly what would make sense for me to do for the individual circumstances of my business and I think I think that's fair there is some that isn't something that government can very easily do and that's that's why we, we very strongly recognize and value the role that intermediaries such as the chamber movement are going to be playing in this and we really want to keep talking to the intermediaries making sure that we're giving them what they need so that they can support business and there's some simple messages we need we do need to keep pushing because some of the things that are where there's friction at the border is complex but some of it isn't some people clearly didn't realize that in order to get goods into the eu there were eu importing procedures as well as uk exporting procedures that's actually the biggest source of turn backs at the um at the short straights people don't have eu import declarations um and it, and it can be very sort of boring things like remembering to pre-notify the, the the customs authorities on the other side that you're coming where you need to do that booking appointments and things like that 
But what I would say is that we really do need um, the insight of people such as yourselves on this call in terms of what's happening on the ground. And just to plea, try and make it as specific as possible in terms of we tried to do X and Y happened. Because um, general general feedback that it's difficult that the you know that systems aren't working. You know, we sympathize massively, but there's not much we can do with that. Similarly, if you think that the um, the authorities of other governments are not being helpful. We do have day-to-day -day contacts with all of them, and we can raise issues. But what we need is sort of hard examples of cases where they're being stricter than they are required under their law. So we are going to keep listening, and we are going to keep trying to fix these issues. We really have been working 24-7 on this stuff. And we need to try and learn the lessons of January so that when the inbound controls come in in July, it works as well as it can. And a final thing. Um, we are very much in the market for your reflections on what we need to do to make things work better in the long term. We did publish a strategy looking forward to 2025 before Christmas, and we really do need you to be quite challenging with us in terms of what we need to be doing over the next months and years to leaving aside the immediate problems to make the border work better. And I will stop there. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, that's that's incredibly helpful um and and i think the three points i took from that are one yep you, the, the efforts have been herculean two your your request of us to be as challenging as possible well you know that sounds like manna from heaven for the bcc and the global business network that's what we pride ourselves on and three i think a very well made uh, way of thinking about the issues so one is kind of teething problems transitional issues lack of understanding two is how the overall structure of the deal is being implemented and working in practice you know are the it systems in place and three there are just some things hardwired into the deal that will be there for as long as the tca exists in its current form and and are just going to become a fact of life and that's kind of what we think and it's very difficult to to disentangle the three but that's that's really interesting thank you and i can say you've already provoked quite a lot of questions which is great but i'm going to come to our our third panelist one of my uh very very valued colleagues from the bcc liam our director of um trade facilitation so absolutely point on point for this call and it's only what 24 hours ago that you were essentially telling the house of lords what's what around borders and trade so we're we're very lucky to have you i just hope that somehow i get ennobled off the back of this uh liam over to you if you wouldn't mind just saying a few words about yourself and and your observations of the last month and and what the immediate future might hold Yes, th thank, thank you, James. Uh, uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, it's, it's good to see the questions coming in. I think there's some really interesting questions in the Q&A that will um, apply to those that have asked them, but also there's some broader points that will come out of those when we come to those. So uh, thanks for putting those questions in and we'll welcome some more. Um, so um, Dan has talked about the perspective from uh, EU into UK um, uh, and, uh, and and what he's, he's hearing from there and, and some issues around the correct paperwork and, and goods arriving into the EU and so on. Um, uh, Tom has talked to the the challenges, if you like, and uh, that, that, that we faced after the TCA was uh, agreed in principle and signed uh, at later, uh, and how that that's going to have a long term impact and the the way that we do trade differently out of uh, Great Britain and the uh, and the, and across the United Kingdom. Uh, and also both, uh, and I take from both of them, so messaging that, that says, okay, some things are not quite right yet, um, at the, at the, but um, actually trade is flowing. And, and my challenge to both of them is, is that actually trade is flowing, but it's flowing at low volume. So uh, we had uh, circumstances whereby many traders, many businesses, um, when they, in the advance of going off or, or on the Christmas break, um, decided that what they would do, they would stock up or supply up um, as far as they could um, into uh, uh, their customers or uh, from their suppliers. And, and so we, we're actually in a period, I think, of a hiatus whereby uh, a lot of the problems we're hearing about are about products of animal origin and food and, 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 and the things that we consume, you know, the kind of uh, fresh produce, because actually that's the thing you, you can stock up less on. So where it's machinery parts and the like, I'm speaking to lots of businesses who, who actually took that action. And so they're not going to feel um, the, the pain, if there is pain indeed, of uh, being out of the single market. 
until the point at which they need to uh, move goods. And, and so um, we are dealing with the circumstances right now where volumes have been um, unnaturally low in the uh, first couple of weeks. And I think Tom could probably confirm we're getting closer to where we would, we would expect to be for a January. Uh, but uh, that it is, remember, it is January and January is a lower volume month. So we've got some volume issues uh, that we need to um, understand better and see whether we flow just as easily with volume as we do uh, uh, at uh, low levels. Um, uh, others have talked to issues around food and uh, export health certificates and catch certificates for fish. Certainly there is a gap that we are hearing and it still remains. And, and, and there's a question on this, I think, actually on the, uh, the Q&A, um, where businesses are still finding it difficult to get uh, EHC, e EHCs from their local council authorities. And, and, and it may be the case that in some case, in, in some councils, they're prioritizing fresh and ambient produce over other project that requires an, a health certificate, but, but isn't at risk of, of going off uh, as it were. So there are some capacity issues around uh, local authorities and the issues, the issues of uh, those certificates. Other thing I will mention is that, that whilst um, uh, we, we got some numbers there and some, some estimates of the number of, 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 of movements that, that were held at the border because of either, um, as Tom put it, the, the absence of a COVID test or incorrect paperwork, uh, we have also seen a number of examples of where the interpretation of the rule by the border agent is incorrect. Uh, and, and we've seen this even uh, in, in uh, Great Britain where, uh, um, uh, you know, we, we, we've had a, a misinterpretation by um, vet, vet, vets and inspectors on, on product uh, and saying that goods should be labelled GB, not UK, when actually they should have been labelled UK, not GB. So uh, we've seen that with inspectors here and also at the, uh, on borders in other countries where their interpretation of the agreement has been just completely wrong. Um, and we've had to address those. So we have to remember as well as traders getting up to speed with these new circumstances, so too do border agents and they're all human, they're all fallible. And so sometimes we'll have to address those until they get um, uh, up to speed. And as difficult as that is, it's just the reality of life right now. And it's really frustrating and it can be really upsetting when your goods are not moving in the way that you hoped that they would. Um, uh, the, the other thing I should say that in terms of chamber customs, you see my backdrop here. So as well as being director of trade facilitation at BCC, I'm also director of a company, uh, a customs brokerage called Chamber Customs that we launched um, about two years ago um, and has become very busy this month uh, uh, because we really set it up uh, for the end of the transition. In fact, we set up originally for day one, no deal. Um, those didn't happen, thankfully. We had a transition period. <clears throat> so we've really become very alive over the last um, uh, four weeks and operating at volume. So as well as talking about trade, actually, we're able to tap into the experience of traders and indeed ourselves as an intermediary in getting trade done. And actually, our experience of the paperwork that we're doing, you won't be surprised to hear, um, has been that actually our paperwork is not being rejected. We get the paperwork right. We're compliance led. That's the end of my advertisement, if you like, for what we do, uh, um, beyond saying that we do still have some capacity available. So any traders on here that are struggling to get their import or export declarations done, please come to Chamber Customs um, and ask us to help you. And I'm sure that we, we can. We've got a network of 200 agents across uh, the UK uh, that can do that work for you. Uh, and so come to us and test us and, and, and uh, we'll do our best to help you. Um, the last thing we need to talk to before we come on to the Q&A uh, is um, this issue that Tom raised about uh, guidance and advice. Now, governments give guidance. It's what they, they do. I think it's it's almost unreasonable to expect that um, the, the authority that, that, that's going to check that you've uh, uh, declared your imports and exports correctly or indeed submitted the, your ta tax return in the right kind of way, because effectively an import declaration is a kind of tax return. Um, it's unreasonable to expect that they would also provide the guidance that you can rely on, um, if you like, and indemnify yourself against uh, and be, become both poacher and gamekeeper. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I, I think it's, it's perfectly reasonable to take that position as HMRC and that and the, 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 uh, the, the government do try to go beyond purely the guidance and help people to understand what they need to do. I, I think it's, it's, I understand why Tom says that, but it still doesn't go far enough 
to the extent that a business who uh, is having to do this work for the first time needs to understand uh, their responsibilities as a business. So it, the only thing that we can ask government to do in, in the absence of that knowledge in our trader network is to support traders to get that knowledge. And so we have been pressing uh, the government, and, and I did yesterday in the, uh, House, at the House of Lords Committee do the same thing, and I'll keep repeating it, but you know, the government has supported the intermediary sector to uh, build capacity. It may have to go further in building that capacity in the months and, and years ahead, but nonetheless, it has done that. What has been absent, though, and, and is really evident now, is the, the, you know, some funding and some support for particularly SMEs to be, to be able to go and source um, proper advice uh, backed by professional indemnity that they can rely on from experts that know what they're talking about, that can give very specific advice to businesses about what they need to do. Uh, now, there are a number of businesses, organizations that, that have the skills and expertise to do that in the UK, um, uh, including Chamber Customs. I mean, the service that we have uh, predominantly been uh, engaged in up until this month has been advisory work uh, and, and, and also uh, training of agents and, and, and other people's businesses. Uh, and so we can do that work and, and others can too. But a lot of SMEs just find, uh, uh, you know, finding the resources to be able to do that can be quite difficult. And so when you need to know how do I certify origin of my goods for the buyers of, of, of the things that I manufacture or, or sell, or how do I um, take care of my importer's knowledge on goods for origin when I buy them from other markets, uh, we can actually, you know, uh, there are, you know, advisors that can give you the information you need to be able to do that so that you're not claiming preferential tariff on goods that you import when you shouldn't be. Uh, or indeed that you are claiming preferential tariff and goods that you import when you should be. And, and I'll be honest with you, about half the occasions that we look at origin on, in, in an advisory capacity in companies, we find businesses that could be claiming preference and are not because they didn't know how to do it. Uh, and, and the other half um, uh, you know, are claiming preference and just need to understand the basis in which they do that and the evidence that they need to keep. So there's a, there's a load of subjects I see on, on, on the Q&A that will come to you on tariff, on origin, on uh, the, the uh, uh, paperwork you need, the issue of double duty being paid as people see it when they pay duty to import into the EU and then pay it again to come from EU to UK or vice versa. Um, and uh, and, and what, what the paperwork requirements are, the complication of import declarations versus export declarations and what, what information you need to have on that. And then this other big issue, which I will just land on, James, if I can briefly, which is whilst we say goods are moving readily from EU to UK and, and, and vice versa, there is a particular issue about the availability of drivers now. The disruption of the last few weeks has meant that we know that a, a number of EU-based drivers are no longer prepared to be sent on jobs that come to the UK. Um, EU drivers typically get paid on the kilometre by the kilometre, not the hour. And so if they're not moving and they don't get paid, um, we're hearing quite a lot of uh, 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 you know, evidence now that businesses are finding it either harder to secure haulage or finding the prices are being inflated. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Liam. And, and I, I know that you have also worked tirelessly for months and years, hand in glove with Tom and colleagues, and also setting up Chamber Customs, which very much is a continuation of the BCC's core traditional role of supporting uh, UK and worldwide trade. That's that's why we were set up 150 years ago and it's at the heart of what we do in many ways. It's an extension of that. Um, so yes, as, as you said, there's lots of questions there. I'm, I'm going to come first to Dan, I think, if that's okay. Dan, a slight pushback, always good to start on a point of challenge. Uh, EU to UK trade, not all that great. Problems with paperwork, problems with hauliers. Um, I, I, I wonder if, if you what, what you might think about that. Yeah, I mean, in in the context of the situation we're in, i.e., that the UK has left the customs union and um, uh, the 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 problems we're seeing the other way, the problems coming from the EU to the UK are less severe. I mean, certainly from what we're getting, there's there are fewer problems. However, uh, that's partly because the UK isn't imposing full customs controls yet, uh, and I think when it does, you will significantly see more problems. Uh, I I don't think that traders all around Europe are fully 
prepared yet for the, for that either. So I think that's the first problem with that. And the second sort of answer I give to that is what Liam just mentioned. Um, because it's not just the rules, it's all everything that goes around it. And I think hauliers in particular, European hauliers don't want to come to the UK right now for a number of reasons. I mean, partly what Liam has mentioned uh, in terms of uh, the way they're paid and the way um, they, they don't want to be sitting, not moving for two or three days. Uh, partly. Secondly, the COVID situation. And there were absolute horror stories uh, about uh, European drivers that were stuck um, at Manston uh, Airfield um, just before Christmas when the borders were closed, who then tested positive for COVID, for example, in that circumstances. Uh, and uh, that combined with the fines now that are being placed on lorries that are forced to, to, to stay in Kent, the general view from Europe is that if you're a haulier, you don't want to go anywhere near the UK. And that's the problem. So I think there's a, there's a real challenge in getting those, um, those hauliers actually to, to do it and do it as a reasonable price, because I think you will find people will take the take the trip but they're only going to take it at a, a high, much more increased cost um and the other point i would say because i i also saw the question that was on the chat on on this area is um you know unfortunately the uk is a third country now uh, from an eu perspective so the idea that you could just send an email and 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 sort of sort out a delivery in the same way as you would from from london to manchester is simply not possible now and it won't be possible the 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 um risk that um companies take uh, in taking goods is more significant now once you're crossing borders and crossing custom zones. So therefore, it's from now on, it's going to be a more complicated process, unfortunately. No, I think that's absolutely fair. It's almost as if the EU and the single market kind of did what it said on the tin in terms of trade facilitation. Uh, who would have thought that? Um, Tom, I'm, I'm not going to ask you about that, don't worry. But um, I'm, I'm going to ask you if that's okay, a very simple question, which betrays my lack of understanding, but it is at the heart of a lot of this. So the EORI -E number, the EORI number, which is absolutely central and a, and a first step all businesses should take. Can you just tell me what that is and why we need it? And it's made up of two bits and blah, blah, blah. Can you just give me a real crash course in, in that and why it's essential, please? I mean, essentially, um, we need it to give people the, um, it's just to get a basic reference so that so that trade can start. I mean, to be honest, I'm going to be really cheeky and hand over to Liam here, because I think he'll probably be able to explain it more succinctly for this audience than I can. No, don't don't well, worry, that, I do that in all sorts of meetings, <laughs> over Liam, including I, our big meetings, Liam. Yeah, so the, the, the ORI number, I mean, it's a common number attached to, you know, it's made up of your VAT number with GB in front of it, typically for those in GB, XI now in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's, so GB or XI, your VAT number and three zeros on the end, typically that would be your ORI number, but you can't just go and make it up. I mean, it has to exist within the custom systems um, across the globe, if you like. Uh, we'll call it across the globe from a UK perspective right now. Uh, and so um, that number has to be recognised. HMRC register that number in their systems, and then uh, they share that, that data with other customs authorities uh, as those goods are transmitted um, or, or leave the UK and go into another market or, um, or when they arrive from another market into the UK. It's that number that relates to your business entity for the purposes of import and export. Fantastic. So it's a way of identifying your company and that you're in some way pucker. No, thank you, Liam and Tom, and I'm, I'm sorry for throwing that curveball. That's the worst sin uh, a panel chair can can commit, I'm sure. And um, and so everything flows from the Iori number both ways, and it's it's made up of those two bits, and, and that's incredibly valuable. And then, Liam, sorry, how does that interrelate with the uh, authorised economic operator point, which is kind of like a a super trader in a way is that is that fair or you, you get some advantages to being one as a company well you, you do so authorized economic operators are uh, businesses that have gone through an authorization process with uh, with a, 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 a hmrc in the uk but also uh, the uh, uh, aeo uh, uh, c uh, AEO, uh, uh, accreditation is recognized um, across the eu it's, it's got mutual recognition of, of its status um, if you speak to companies with AEO status, the principal advantage they, they achieve is a 70% reduction in the guarantee that they have to have in place for duty deferment. So um, if, if you required a 10,000 uh, guarantee uh, um, 
uh, uh, you know, for, for the goods that you're going to import um, on uh, for, to cover the duty element of the uh, the importations um, each month. Um, if you had AEO, you could reduce that £10,000 down to £3,000 of a bond or, se or security. Of course, uh, Tom will be itching for me to also say that uh, companies can benefit right now from a guarantee waiver up to £10,000 uh, um, automatically, and particularly if they have an AEO authorization, uh, and, uh, and they can apply to increase that guarantee waiver to greater sums if they have um, you know, a, a trading history that shows they require those sums and that they've not got any defaults with HMRC and they've paid their bills in time and they have a good record. But authorised economic operator principally is about reducing guarantees. Um, and for UK traders, there are no, you know, special, you know, blue lanes that they go through um, uh, the ports uh, and, and, and access or route through ports more quickly. Um, but the, the, there's, you know, there is the opportunity, I guess, to um, to, to create those kinds of advantages uh, in future. But so far, uh, you know, we don't see that in the UK. I think that's something for later. And when we move to single window, perhaps Tom would come in and say more about that. Absolutely. I think that the, um, you know, AEO is the, is a very particular thing, which is one of the ben big benefits of it, that it, it has mutual recognition. And this was one of the things, obviously, that we secured with the trading cooperation agreement with the mutual recognition of, of AEO schemes. Looking forward, there is something much more fundamental that we want to look at in terms of trust. Because one of the things we got in the responses to the 2025 strategy, you know, you know us, we go through the border all the time. So kind of can we go to the front of the queue and not get sort of silly questions? So this is something that we want to look at on a cross government basis, but that's very much for the longer term. Hey, fabulous. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Liam. And, 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 and I think anything that I suppose focuses the resource required to check stuff on the people where it's much more likely to throw up problems makes sense from all sorts of perspectives. So I'm sure subject to the detail, we're, we're very willing to work with you on that one. And, and I suppose anything that allows you to do as much of the work in advance of getting to the border de-risks a little bit. And, th and that brings me on to another question, Tom. Um, so just uh, broadly around pre-lodgement uh, of goods and, um, and certificates and what have you, can you just explain a little bit more of, of this works? A couple of questions have come in where it seems to be causing people delays. So pre-lodgement in, in, in what terms? The, um, I'm just going through the questions to see um, is, is it something more specific than that? It was just in general around pre-lodgement and how that works was, was the one that came up. I've just marked it as answered, I'm afraid. I've slightly jumped the gun there. <laughs> I, right. I, I, I might hand over. I mean, basically, I, I, I'm basically not an HMRC technical person. I'm so sorry, so sorry. I struggle I'm with something. Sorry. Yeah. It, it, on the contrary, actually, pre-lodgement pre um, shouldn't result in delays. It, it should, by pre-lodging, you know, that something is going to happen. And certainly in our experience, um, uh, the the uh, the uh, pre-lodgement of, of an entry actually helps because uh, when you know the, the systems know to expect the goods to arrive at a specific port, and uh, as long as the uh, you know deferment account is appointed to account for any duties, uh, the company has, uh, has has said that they're going to use postponed VAT accounting for the VAT element. Uh, those goods typically would clear automatically from the inventory system. Um, that would certainly be uh, the way that it would work for Chamber Customs, where we have, um, you know, we, we do have um, links, direct links with all of the ports in the UK. So um, we can even account for a pre-lodgement at Dover and where the ship then moves to not dislodge at Dover, but to dislodge at another rural port. Uh, Dover's a bad example. Let's say Folkestone and Southampton, then we can we can shift the clearance of the goods from one to to another. That's possible to do. So, um, look, there there are pre-lodgement should not be something that causes delay. Pre-lodgement is something that actually speeds the process process up. No, fantastic. Thank you. I think that's right. The more the more we can get it up and running the better. And, and Daniel, just, just coming to you a little bit, and, and again, this EU side, we've had a really interesting question, which is there seem to be some very real differences between how individual member states are handling some of these things, and actually those kind of cultural and 
uh, structural requirements are affecting the flows of goods. So a British company is doing exactly the same thing and it's affecting the, the flows of those, those stuff. Is that something you see? Is there, is there a move towards slightly greater uh, standardization or, or actually is the answer somewhere else or is that not really a problem on your radar? It is, and it is a problem. And I think it's it's one of the the misunderstandings maybe about the EU in that it's a it's a single entity for trading. So you have a single set of rules and from customs that are EU rules when you're coming in, but they are incorporated and delivered through all of the member states. So they are interpreted differently in each member state, uh, unfortunately. Now you will have the basic uh, uh, rules, but there will be domestic rules on top of that, and domestic interpretation that will sometimes be different. So, what we're seeing, you know, generally at the moment is, um, particularly France, uh, you know, are applying the rules really to the letter. Um, um, Belgium has a uh, similar to the UK has deferred some of the um, fines that you would face if you broke customs rules for a period of time. They haven't deferred the rules, but they've deferred the fines uh, with a view to trying to ease this for, for a period of time. Uh, and the Dutch have um, also been relatively uh, uh, strict, as have the Germans, from what we understand. But the you know the basics of this is each country will interpret it differently and you will see depending on which country you import into slightly different um uh, approaches uh not just national level but i think as as was mentioned earlier even just down to individual uh customs officers interpreting things in a slightly different way uh, and that's just the nature of the eu it's it's never going to be one size fits all because it's always implemented by the by the national government no, fantastic. So a little bit of local knowledge goes a long way, even when dealing with a, a single set of rules. And, and I suppose that makes sense in all of our lives. You know, uh, I, I know that sometimes one government department will respond slightly differently to exactly the same request. That's just natural. Um, and, and I think that gets us into another issue, which is moving goods via the UK from one uh, EU nation to another. Um, this double duty issue. Liam, I, I think that, that's something you've you've come across is that is that a problem you see in on a regular basis or yeah yeah it's a, it's a problem james that many companies are coming to realize and, and uh, uh, thomas who's uh, just asked a question about uh, this on the chat and others too that answered previously um, are realizing that when they um, when they bring goods from the european union into the uk uh, they bring them uh, as long as they meet the preference uh, uh, um, of prefer preferential uh, conditions of uh, uh, of uh, being able to certify them as as or EU origin, and they need to make sure, of course, that they can meet those uh, responsibilities. There is a grace period of twelve months during which time you you've got twelve months to gather the information you would need to be able to prove preference. It's not a grace period that absolves you of any responsibility. But let's say that you know that the goods are EU origin, you bring them into the UK tariff free. Um, uh, and uh, Th Thomas, is, uh, his example is, you know, um, talking about uh, goods, uh, simple distribution, no processing involved. They're German or Italian products that are imported into the UK, but then a customer in Belgium wants to buy them. Well, they can come into the UK tariff free from Germany and, and Italy as long as they're EU origin goods. And, and if they're goods that came from China, and landed in the EU into the single market, then they're not, they don't suddenly become EU origin. They're still Chinese origin or you know, uh, US origin or wherever they've come from in the first place. So they, they um, would have paid the tariff into the EU um, in, in those circumstances. They've come to the UK and paid the tariff in the UK because they're not EU origin or German or uh, sorry, they're Chinese or US origin. And, uh, and then when they go back to Belgium, they would take, pay the tariff again. So the simple uh, uh, act of importing finished products from third countries or indeed from the EU into the UK um, doesn't allow you to confer UK origin in those products when you re-export them to Belgium or to anywhere else. If you have not carried out substantial processing, then uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, reach the processing standards then those goods will be subject to tariff. I, I spoke to a, a company only yesterday, one that we're advising who, who faced this exact problem. So they import their finished products by and large, 95% finished product from Japan. Uh, they come into the UK. Of course, UK-Japan agreement allows those to arrive here 
tariff free. Um, uh, the tariff would otherwise be about 2%. Um, but when they re-export to the European Union, to their customers, because the distribution base is the, in the UK, their European hub is the UK, those re-exported goods are subject to that 2% tariff when they arrive in the European Union. And, and so the question they have, of course, is, and how do we avoid this? Well, the answer is only one answer, is don't ship to the UK, ship to the European Union for those European Union customers' uh, product demand. Um, and, 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 and actually, that's what they, they uh, are probably going to intend to do, is to set up in France where they have a subsidiary company and they'll deal with the uh, imports there and the import duty, sorry, import VAT at the, uh, at the French side um, on goods that arrive from Japan. And then they'll resell those goods and therefore be able to balance the VAT on the sale of those goods into multiple European markets. The consequence, of course, for the UK as an economy on that uh, advice is not good. That's not good, you know, that's not great for UK, UK economy. But it is uh, an example of where the circumstances of uh, leaving the single market are such that they will result in significant change in an adaptation of supply chains necessarily for companies to remain economic. And so you can't avoid the, the issue of double duty if you import from outside the EU into the EU, and, and in that import you pay duty. When you re-export from the EU, those will not be EU origin goods and will be subject to duty payments in the UK. And then if you re-export those goods, as many small businesses do, um, back to the European Union, they would be subject to duty again. And so what you need to work out is what's the lowest cost or the lowest number of times you will be subject to duty. You can't confer origin on a product just because it's, it, it landed in a country. There's more to it than that. James, could I just come in on that just to add a bit of context to this as well? Because the UK government did actually ask in the negotiations for what they would call cumulative uh, rules of origin rules, which would have avoided diagonal. this. Yeah, diagonal accumulation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, uh, because there's a specific issue, for example, uh, both the UK and the EU have tariff free deals with uh, most of the poorest countries in the world. Um, and so therefore you bring in some uh, something from, uh, you know, um, somewhere some like Niger or Chad or uh, Ghana uh, into the UK um, uh, at tariff free, which then uh, you and then you export it back into the EU where it's no longer tariff free and it hits the MFN. Um, uh, which is the normal WTO uh, rate, which often from the EU side is quite high. Um, there's an issue there in global trade because, of course, that uh, makes less of a demand for these goods coming from the poorest countries in the world in the first place. Uh, so there is an issue, but the UK asked for it. And the reason why the EU rejected it was uh, exactly as Liam uh, highlighted there is they didn't want the deal to allow the UK to remain a distribution hub for the entire European single market. That's ultimately the political um, reason behind it and why I think it's unlikely you're going to see any change in the near future. Yeah, that, that's Go really ahead. helpful, uh, Dan, to, to add, add that in there. That's an important aspect of it. I mean, I, I'd go further and say it wasn't that, it, that the EU wanted to ensure the UK doesn't remain a distribution hub, but actually they didn't want the UK to become a significant distribution hub for the EU, whereby had they, if they provide diagonal accumulation, we would have that opportunity to grow our economy in, in that way. Uh, and so it was an avoidance, definitely an avoidance measure. Um, I would like to think that in the continue, you know, con in, at the points of review on the, uh, the TCA, that there may be some opportunity to provide for diagonal accumulation in some circumstances. So I probably am a glass half full guy anyway, but I remain hopeful that there'll be some opportunity to, to demonstrate to the European Union the benefits of diagonal accumulation to the EU as well. So look, I mean, we, we you're, you're right. I mean, we did push this very much during the negotiation. The lack of di diagonal accumulation was not a some kind of oversight. And it is also something on which ministers have heard loud and clear that I think ministers are having to learn about more about rules of origin than they than they ever thought they would have to and um, so this is going to be very much on our minds when we talk to the eu going forward but you know it equally it was a very deliberate decision on the eu's part not to accede to our request 
Of course, thank you, Tom. And, and it, it kind of that makes a lot more sense to me now. And, and it sounds like at the moment it is going to be the position for the foreseeable future. But we do know things are going to change a little bit in, in six months' time when the full suite of rules and requirements kick in the other way. How, how, how are, you, you talked before, Tom, I think, about learning the lessons of January and December. And one of them is don't try and do it on, on December the 24th, which I'm, I'm sure was not your fault, which was one of those things. But how are preparations going? You know, should businesses now be planning for a, a more disruption or more checks or, or, or are we comfortable actually it can go relatively smoothly? I, I mean, I'm not expecting, you know, we don't have the same fears of disruption that we feared in, the, in just in terms of sheer gridlock at the ports, meaning that those who were prepared were stuck behind those who were not prepared. I'm not, I'm not expecting that. I mean, the, you know, the lessons that we are, that we are learning, we have to make sure that we are, that we're targeting the right people and with messages that actually work. So this is this, this group, European business, it, that's a difficult group to get at. And we obviously we're talking to, to other governments, we've got good contacts with some representative bodies around the EU and we just want to get the the message across that when we say that there will be uh, you know customs declarations required on the point of goods arriving in the UK and that there will be border control posts operating SPS checks that we that we do actually mean it that first of July deadline is not going to move a lot of people thought the the first of January deadline would move we said it wouldn't we said that a deal wouldn't make a huge amount of difference to that but I what I would encourage people the, the one message I would see it was there on the questions is yeah first really do not bet any money on first of July moving because I really do not believe it will yeah uh, that certainly all the signals we're getting from everywhere is you know this is now set and, and won't evolve um, and good to hear that's going on and I'm sure we'll, we'll feed into those those processes as they come through. We're, we're running a little bit close to time. It's been a, a brilliant discussion. I'm going to have one last question, which is a wee bit off topic, and then we'll go to summing up. But I'm, I'm going to come to you, Dan, for, for the final word, if that's OK. Um, we're, we're doing specific uh, webinars around services and other things, but I'm just going to ask you a little bit more about the um, the movement of people, business visas, etc., which is a problem that comes up. and. And, and I think has blindsided people a little bit, you know, how how clear do you think that the guidance and understanding is? How much of an issue is this? You know, is this going to be an increasing problem as we unwind, hopefully, from a lockdown scenario across the continent over the next six to nine months? Yeah, I think this has obviously been uh, smoothed over a little bit at the moment because people are not traveling and they're not traveling really for work. Um, so, uh, but it is gonna be a big issue. Now, uh, maybe I just, Give you a bit of the background here because the the uh, the agreement covers some of this. Okay, so um, the basics are um, that a UK citizen can can go into the EU any ninety days within one hundred and eighty days. That's within the Schengen zone, so it's not all EU countries, but it includes some countries that are not EU countries. Uh, slightly confusing. Um, and um, now you are allowed to provide some. Well, you're allowed, you're allowed to do some work in that, and that's outlined within the the trade uh, agreement. Uh, but it's basically business meetings, more or less, attendance at conferences, uh, repairing uh, you, um, goods that have been sold to customers in the EU. This type of thing. Now, where it gets confusing, uh, first of all, is that um, although all member states must apply the trade deal element of it, um, there are some aspects of the trade deal that some member states can opt into. So for example, on posted workers, some member states can opt into it. Belgium has just opted into that, which would allow more or less continuation of existing rules on, on posted workers. But some countries have exemptions from even things that are in the trade deal. For example, uh, Austria, for example, have an exemption as to Bulgaria of some elements of it. So the, the bottom line is there is no EU approach to this. Uh, because even under the bit where there is an EU approach, there are still some opt-outs for some member states and opt-ins. Now, beyond that, it's completely in the um, control of each member state then to decide what you could do uh, from a business perspective in those 90 days when you're in, uh, when you're in an EU country. Um, and therefore, it's different. There will be 30 different regimes. You will need to be very clear of what is happening in the member state where you're sending people if they are going to do work. Um, now, 
just our our chamber here we do have on our website uh, we're putting all of this together from all the different countries so we hopefully will have a resource that people can use but of course that is not you know that shouldn't be taken again as legal advice that's just simply we're trying to put that service uh, there was a specific question i think on the um on the um thing as well about um if you are moving people for more than 90 days now the basic outline is if you're going to work and provide a service in uh, any european country you're you would need a work permit uh, that is the, the the basic similar to if you were going to send people to the us for example uh, it's the same situation now where it gets slightly complex is if you are for example uh, if you are receiving payment from a EU entity, even if that is going to an EU entity, and then the EU the UK entity is then paying the worker, that would still, in most member states, be classed as work. And the basic principle is any work should be provided by an EU national. If it's not provided by an EU national, you need to get a work permit to provide it. So there was a specific question there on people staying over 90 days. Now, just looking at the question in the first place, I think you would need to check whether your, your workers could actually work under 90 days uh, in the type of project you're, you're talking about without a work visa, because you, you simply can't cross the border and go to work uh, in most in Shanghai countries anymore, firstly. But secondly, those 90 days also include any leisure trips. So if you were to send a worker for 90 days to the EU, um, uh, they then couldn't go on holiday to anywhere in the Schengen zone for until their 180 days were up. So this is gonna take some managing. The European Commission does have a Schengen calculator to calculate where you are on the number of days. But very broadly, most work that you might have already done or sent people to do in the EU uh, in the past is probably going to need a work permit. Fantastic. So. Uh, I'm not sure how happy I'd be with the BCC if they sent me to work for 91 days and then suddenly I couldn't go go to France for my holidays, although alas, that feels like quite a remote possibility anyway. Uh, given the timing, I'm going to call stumps there, uh, gentlemen. It's been a fabulous... Can I, can I just answer, briefly answer oh, yes, another question related, it's a supplementary to the origin question that, that uh, uh, so, someone has asked about um, wh why can you not confer Japanese origin on goods that were landed in the EU and are then coming to the UK when both parties have got trade agreements with Japan. And the reason is that you can only confer origin for preference purposes on direct exports. So if the goods came from Japan into a customs warehouse in the EU but didn't go into free circulation and then came to the UK, yes, you can confer origin on those because it's, it's, it's a, an export that came directly to the UK. It may have stopped off at a few points. But if the goods enter free circulation of the European Union, you can no longer continue to confer uh, origin and benefit from preference. They must be direct exports. Thank you, James. No, fabulous. Thank you very much, Jamie. It's, it's, uh, it's always much better to have people chomping at the bit to answer more questions rather than fewer, if only I'd thought like that during my GCSEs. Um, it's, it's been a really fabulous and interesting discussion. I think within an hour, we could only ever scratch the surface of, of a subject this wide and this broad, but I think we've done much more than that. So I'd like to give my and the BCC's heartfelt thanks to Tom, uh, to Dan and to Liam, all of whom have given us some really useful insight. Um, and I think it's fair to say that we hope that things will bed in a little bit more. Um, I think there has been a lot of half full glass, which is very useful, but there are some pretty tricky issues. Um, we will continue to work and try and resolve them. And I know that, that colleagues will. Um, just looking forward a little bit, um, we have the next one of these in our series on the 15th, where we're looking at trading um, between GB and NI, which should be an interesting and slightly topical question. Um, this is the first of these webinars where Percy pigs haven't come up, but I'm certain they will come up in terms of uh, on the next on the 15th. Um, as you have more detailed questions, there are lots of sources of advice out there in terms of some of the um, work permit issues. The um, British Chamber in the EU and Belgium has a fabulous website and much more broadly. Obviously, .gov.uk is a repository of a huge amount of information, including a tariff lookup. But I'm going to finish, as I would, of course, to say, in my mind, at least, the two best places to go would be your, your local chamber, whether that's within the uh, within GB and the UK, or internationally, or most importantly, I would say Liam and his colleagues at Chamber Customs are truly world-class at this, which they absolutely are. 
the amount of emails I have to send them asking some simple things so I can then go to meetings and essentially regurgitate them is slightly embarrassing. But it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Liam. Thank you, Daniel. I'll leave everyone to go around their afternoons and hopefully see as many of you as possible on the 15th. Bye, everyone. Thank you, James. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you, everyone.